when it comes to these topics of heaven and hell and everything in between, uh, there's a lot of questions that we might have, whether it's about heaven or hell or those in-betweens. Now, some of those questions we can share with others. We feel very comfortable about it. We can ask other people and things like, you know, what, what might heaven be like or what happens when we die? Just some questions like that. So a lot of us can ask those questions to other people. But there are some of these questions of the in-between that we might not be so comfortable asking somebody else. They're the kind of questions that the only one who really knows about it is your web browser. It's the kind of questions that you don't want to bring up because you're maybe worried about what somebody might say or how somebody might act if you bring up these questions. Well, this morning I want to tackle one of those questions. And it's not going to be an easy question. It's a question that I know for some of us uh, will be incredibly triggering. It might cause us to feel or think things that maybe we don't want to feel or think this morning. If you are someone who has struggled, struggled with thoughts of depression, of suicide, uh, this morning might be a challenging morning for you. But I want to encourage you this morning that if you are struggling, if you have some thoughts, maybe around your life, maybe around your desire not to be living, I'd encourage you to call the suicide prevention line. Talk to somebody who can help you through this. This morning, we are going to be talking about suicide. It's not an easy topic. It's a topic that, uh, if I was honest, I would probably rather not be sharing about. But I think it's a topic that's important that we talk about. It's important because there's a lot of ideas out there, and in particular, there's some ideas in the church around suicide that maybe have caused us not to talk about it. And maybe because we haven't talked about it, it's caused more harm than we've intended. So this morning, I want to tackle one of the tough questions around people who choose to end their lives. And it's a question that some of us have asked, and I know we've asked it. Some of us have only asked it to our web browsers and tried to figure out the answer. And that's the question of, if somebody commits suicide, do they go to hell? As I said, this is going to be a challenging morning. This is going to be a morning where maybe some of us would rather have not listened, or maybe we're tuning in online later on, watching it on demand, and we're thinking, wow, I really didn't want to think about this. If you're in a place where you're worried about yourself, or where you're thinking about things maybe aren't as good as you would like them to be, and maybe you would like to step out of this life, again, I encourage you to call someone for help. Maybe you're not sure about the phone number. It's been on the screen, and you should see it. But call the helpline, and someone will help you. Reach out to me, and I would gladly sit down and talk with you about it. Because there's more to life than what we experience at any given moment, and life is worth living. But this morning, as we talk about this sensitive topic, there's a few reasons why I think it's important that we do. Some of you might know that part of the motivation of this series as to why we are doing this series is we've been looking at what are people asking on the internet? What are some of the things about God, about church that people are asking? And so we've wanted to tackle some of those things. And this is one of those questions. And it's an important question to reflect on and answer. Because there has been a teaching in the church, a particular branch of the church, that maybe has done more harm than good than we realize. But it's also just important to talk about suicide because there was kind of this thought that a lot of us have had at different points where that we felt like if we talk about it, maybe we would be encouraging it. But the science is actually the opposite. When we talk about it, we help. We help people get past what they're feeling in a moment. We help people make better choices as to what they will do next. And so we're talking about it this morning. We're talking about it because men are three to four times more likely to commit suicide than women. But young women, aged like 30 and younger, are about five times more likely to harm themselves. One in 10 of us have thought about committing suicide. One in 10. If you're going into a coffee shop and there are 10 people there, there's a good chance that one of you in that shop has thought about it. One of those people might be you. And more than that, 3% of us who are still living in Canada have tried to commit suicide. 
That means 3% of those people who've survived. The actual number is probably more staggering than we'd like to admit. That's a lot of people. It is the ninth leading cause of death in Canada. And sometimes when we don't talk about these sorts of things, those numbers just grow. And the truth is, actually, the Bible talks about it a lot. The Bible talks about it a lot in people who have actually committed suicide. There are some tragic stories of King Saul, some of us might be familiar with, who chose to end his own life. And Judas, we know who betrayed Jesus, who chose to end his own life. There's these tragic stories in there, but there are also individuals who we may look to as heroes, as great examples of faith, who've also struggled with wanting to die. In fact, the the prophets are a great example of this. There, There are a multitude of prophets in the Old Testament who are individuals who are invited by God to share God's news, share God's wisdom, share God's insight to bring people back to God, And they're doing this, and more often than not, they want to die. We read in Jonah that as Jonah, who did not want to do what God invited him to do, but did it anyways, he wishes he would die at the end. Jeremiah repeatedly desires for his life to be over. Elijah. Elijah has this incredible encounter with the prophets of Baal where he proves that God, Yahweh, is the God. And afterwards, he is exhausted and he wishes his life was over. We are not alone in these feelings. We are not alone sometimes when we feel like we've had enough. That story of Elijah is one that uh, I cling to at times because to me, it represents what a lot of us go through. Because the truth is that suicidal thoughts and suicide is non-discriminatory. It doesn't matter if you're male or female. It doesn't matter if you're young or old. It doesn't matter what country you're from or your ethnic background. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. We all struggle at times of feeling overwhelmed and having had too much and not know what to do. And Elijah, to me, is an example of it. Elijah The story, as I said, is he encounters uh, these prophets of Baal. He challenges them to prove that his God is the real God and their God is not. And after the end of this encounter with these amazing things where God shows up and people realize, wow, this is really what's happening. The story unfolds in 1 Kings 19. It says, now Ahab told Jezebel. So Ahab is the king. Jezebel is his wife, his wife has, the story goes, Jezebel has led Ahab to worship other gods and in effect has caused all of God's people to worship other gods. So now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah. May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow... I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah has just had this incredible encounter, this incredible moment where God just does amazing things, where he's used by God to do amazing things, and his life is threatened. His life is threatened by this queen saying that, you know what, let the gods, those other gods who didn't show up to the event that just happened, let them deal with me if I don't kill you by this time tomorrow. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. Elijah, this hero of faith, this individual who's done amazing things for God, after these amazing things he's done for God, has this moment where it feels like it's too much and he wants to die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. 
I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. How many of us have had those moments where we've called out to God and said, I've just had enough. School is just too much. It is too much. All of the homework, all of the work, all of the studying, all the group projects, it's just too much. I can't handle it. I can't keep it up. Work is just too much. It is just so many deadlines and so many colleagues and so many bosses breathing down my neck. It's just too much. Family is just too much. I love them sometimes, you might be thinking, but it's just too much. I can't keep up with everything they need and I just can't have time for myself. It's just too much. Sometimes we feel like it's just too much. And we cry out to God, or maybe we even just keep it inside and say, I just wish it was over. Too many of us suffer like this in silence, and we suffer like this alone, which is why we need to talk about it today. You are not alone if you are feeling this. Here is one of those people in history who was feeling it. And I got to tell you, it turns out better in the end because he chooses not to go that way. But we'll talk about that in a minute. You are not alone. More of us are struggling than you probably realize. But the question is, if someone you know, and you may know someone, a loved one, who has chosen to end their life prematurely, what happens? Well, first, let's answer another question. Is suicide a sin? And the answer is yes. Suicide is. Why is suicide a sin? Well, it's like why so many other things are considered a sin. A sin is anything that misses the mark of what God has for us. If God's desire for us is to be fully alive to experience life in all of its fullness, as Jesus says in John's gospel. To end that life prematurely is to miss the mark on what God intended for us. So in that sense, yes, it is a sin. It is not what God desires for us. It is not what God's best is for us. But that doesn't change how we feel and doesn't change how we feel overwhelmed at times. Many of us feel the struggle more than we want to admit. So then the second question is, what happens to someone who commits suicide? If when we die, we are to go to the place that God prepares for us, which we're going to talk about in the next few weeks even more, what happens to someone who died in the sin of suicide? Well, there's a teaching that is fairly actually recent for the, some branches of the church. It says that those people who commit suicide are apart from God. It actually comes from Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas has, has given a lot to the life of the church, but in the 13th century, he wrote his uh, theological summary, and one of the topics that he tackles is suicide. And in his theological summary, he says that, well, to choose to end your life is to go against the nature of things that people are made to live. And so to choose to end it is to go against the nature of it. And to choose to end your life is to commit murder. And God has told us not to kill in the commandments. So he deduced, said that, well, this obviously is a sin then, and that sin would separate us from God. And being part of a tradition in the Catholic Church that he was part of, he would say that didn't mean you went to hell, but you went to be in purgatory. And your sentence in purgatory would be greater than someone who had not committed suicide. Some people over time kind of sum that up to say, well, that means that people who commit suicide go to hell. But that wasn't necessarily Aquinas' teaching. And it's definitely not biblical, okay? I'll tell you right now, I don't know where everybody goes when they die, but I can tell you That first off, purgatory is not a biblical concept in the way it's been taught in some traditions. And second, suicide is not a guarantee that someone is away from God forever. 
I know it's not biblical because it goes against the teaching of Scripture that someone would end up in a place like purgatory. Well, in Romans 5, verse 8, it says that God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God has demonstrated his love for us that Christ, Jesus, the anointed one, the Messiah, the one whose hope we put in, we put our hope in to experience life in all of its fullness and life eternal, went to the cross for you, for me, for everybody. While we were still sinners, while we didn't know any better, while we were not living the way God had for us. And because of that, Christ died for us. Someone who sins one way is equal to someone who sins another way. No sin is unequal, basically, in Scripture. There's only one moment where a sin is said to be unforgivable and In the gospel accounts, Jesus recounts how there is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which is unforgivable. And what that is, for some reason, people get really confused at this unforgivable sin. But what that is, is not suicide. What that is, is to attribute the work of God to the devil. To attribute the work of God to the devil is the unforgivable sin. That means basically you choose to align yourself not with God forever. That's what it's talking about. This is not that. This is not that. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we didn't know any better, Christ died for us. And because of that, we have hope in eternity. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The punishment for sin is death. Eternal separation from God is what it's speaking of. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Meaning, those who find themselves in Christ have hope in eternity forever. It goes on a long time. What someone chooses today does have an effect on their eternity in the sense that every day we choose to be more and more like Christ or less and less like Christ. But someone who commits a sin is equal to anyone else who commits a sin. I am sure there are many of us who have done something, an action that is contrary to what God has for us, and have never thought twice about it. That time in grade two when you stole your neighbor's, uh, you know, hedge clippers for some reason, is equal to someone who has chosen to take their life. You might have forgot that time that you stole those hedge clippers because you thought, you know, hey, this could help my dad do the chores on the weekend. You forgot all about it but it is equal to someone who does it today or any other time. There is no differentiating in the value economy of sin. It's all the same. And Christ died for it all. The stuff you forget and the stuff you forget to mention as well. John 1.22 says that he, Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice for our sin, meaning He is what pays the price for those things that have missed the mark in our lives. Not just the reality that we are born into a disconnect from God, which is sin, but the choices we make throughout life that disconnect us more and more. Jesus has paid a price for it. He has redeemed those choices. Not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world, 1 John 2.2. He's the atoning sacrifice for our sins, but not only for ours, but for the whole world. Jesus has made the wrongs right, even when we don't recognize it. Ephesians 2 8 says, For the grace, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself, it is a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. God has 
given you grace. Every decision you've made in life has not always been a good one. And unfortunately, some people make a decision that ends their life. And that's not a good one either. But God has given us all the same grace to be saved in, to be forgiven in. If someone chooses to end their lives, it is not an automatic eternity away from God. That is not a biblical picture of how we understand what Jesus did on the cross. It's just not how it works. But I can tell you that someone who chooses to end their life early misses an opportunity for the life and all the fullness that Jesus offers as well. Because life, as hard as it is at times, is so worth living. And every one of us has experienced that hardness of life where we feel like we're underneath the tree and going, I've had enough, God, just end it. Just like Elijah. So when this happens to Elijah, it says, all at once, after he, he says, he lay down in a bush and fell asleep, it was all at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by the food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into the cave and spent the night. For Elijah, he could not see past the moments that he was in to see anything good, and he needed someone to care for him. He had a messenger from God care for him, whether it's a supernatural angel or a person who has come from God as a messenger. It's the same word. It says just sleep, eat, sleep, eat, and then do what you have to do. For so many of us, we are in moments where we feel overwhelmed and we can't see past those moments, but those moments are not everything. Sometimes we need a nap and a sandwich to be recharged or someone just to take care of us for a while. Maybe you are someone who struggles with this regularly. You struggle with wondering if you can keep going. You're not alone in that struggle. I can guarantee you that when we meet in person, we'll have you know, more than 10 people here. That means at least one in the group is feeling the same thing. You're not alone. Life has more value than we sometimes realize. Because sometimes we're in these moments where it all just seems too hard and we can't handle it. I want to encourage you, if you are struggling with this, to reach out to someone. To reach out to someone, whether it is calling the helpline, whether it is sending me an email, a text, or a phone call. Reaching to someone you know, maybe it's a friend or a family member, and tell them how you're feeling. It's hard sometimes to see past a moment in our lives. I want to encourage you not to get wrapped into the moment of what you feel all the time. Sometimes when you're in struggle, it's hard to see outside of that struggle. And so you need some perspective. So you need someone to speak into your life. You need to step out of it for a bit, but not permanently. You need to remember that, you know, nothing is final. So whatever you are going through right now doesn't have to be the end experience. Nothing is final until it's over. And when we choose to take our own life, we decide what's final. It can and will get better. But sometimes we need to see beyond our moments to see what God might have for us. Because the truth is that you were made for so much more. In Ephesians 2.10, God says that you are his masterpiece. The Apostle Paul writes this. He says, you are God's handiwork. You are God's 
masterpiece. The word is poema. It's a beautiful poem. You are God's work of art. And because you are God's work of art, you are created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared for you in advance to do. God does have something for you. And in this moment, it might be hard to see what that is. But if you can take a break from the moment, not let what you feel become fact, not become overwhelmed by it, maybe take a break, take some rest, have some food, talk to someone. You can step through the moment to see what it is that is good that God has for you because he has something good. And you need to remember what John wrote in 1 John 3, that you are deeply loved more than you know. He says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. You are not your mistakes. You are not your family of origin. You are not your past. You are a child of God in Christ. You are God's masterpiece. And you are lavishly loved by him. And that is what we are, children of God. The reason the world does not know it is that it did not know him. People don't see how valuable you are, valuable you are because they don't know God. If they knew God, they would know that you are God's masterpiece. That whatever your struggle is right now, whatever you're struggling with, whether it's financial, whether it's emotional, whether it's spiritual, whether it's mental, whether it's physical, whatever you are struggling with, your relational struggles, your school struggles, your work struggles, whatever those are, does not take away from you being a masterpiece and you being someone God said is worth it, is so worth it that Christ died on the cross for you so that you can experience life in the fullness, forgiveness of sins, and the grace that he offers to know you are a masterpiece. So the answer is, There is no thing you can do to make God love you less and offer you eternity with him. But it is up to you to choose that eternity. I pray that if you are someone who is struggling right now or just struggles sometimes, that you reach out to someone to talk. That you don't let the moments of today define your forever. And that you see how much you are loved by God and others. And let yourself be embraced by that love to know that you are worth it. And this life is worth living together. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you call us your masterpiece. That you, even when we don't believe it, you know it to be true that we are a work of art, that we are far more valuable than we realize. I pray this morning for those of us who are struggling with thinking we're valuable. Maybe we just think we're overwhelmed, that we've got just had enough, that our relationships are broken, that our marriages, our friendships, they're deteriorating, that our school or our home or our work life is just too much. God, a lot of us are carrying heavy, heavy burdens. But you are the God who invites us to bring them to Jesus' cross, to recognize that you carry our burdens with us. We are not alone. We are deeply loved. And I pray for anybody who's watching online or listening on a podcast, that they too know the deep love that you give us, that you offer us, the deep love of your presence in our life through the person of the Holy Spirit, that you are with us always, even when we feel alone at these times. We truly are not alone because you are with us. Help us to reach to you and to others to find the encouragement in life that we need at times. I pray for whoever's listening to this that maybe is feeling like they've had enough, like Elijah, and just feeling like, I just can't do it anymore. I pray for these people, God, that they take their moments and realize their moments have 
don't have to be final. And that they can see the hope that you offer and find the life that you give. Help them to take a break, take a pause, to reach out, to talk to someone, to be embraced by you and someone else, and know that they are loved and they are worth it. Let us pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.